I wanted to make three points about this process and about the faith-based statement in particular. First, I wanted to say that it's rare for a community to come together from diverse political uh, spec, you know, diverse political sectors, diverse uh, competencies, disciplines, backgrounds, and faith traditions to enunciate a vision of their community. And that's exactly what this report does. Um, it says that the community does not recognize itself in the prevailing national narrative of a violent, lawless, and, uh, and chaotic border region. And that's a problem because narratives, not facts, often drive public policy. This process, which I've been happy to be involved in, is sought to change a new narrative that's grounded in the lived experience of border residents and that builds on the values that residents think characterize their communities. Family values, the values of stewardship, the value of generosity and hospitality and solidarity with others. The document um, supports border enforcement, but it makes the point that national security actually starts with human security, with the safety and well-being of all members of the community. Those are the touchstones and public policies that separate families or drive residents away from institutions or places um, where their well-being or their conscience requires them to be run afoul of this vision. So that's the first point. The second point is that the narrative recognizes that the aspirations and the success of border communities can't be realized unilaterally. Border communities are binational, they're interdependent, they share family members, they share economies, they share aquifers, airsheds, eco, uh, ecosystems. The potential for economic development and their ability to solve pressing social problems often and usually depends on cross-border collaboration and the flow of people and goods north and south. In addition, the document makes the point um, as Fernando did, that these communities bear the main consequences of national and binational policies that they did very little to shape or had very little say in. And that needs to change. Immigration enforcement, it's true, is a national challenge, but it's taking place in border communities and it needs to be informed and crafted and accountable to these communities. The Gang of Eight bill calls for a commission of border residents to play this role. I think that's a very good idea. However, the increased border buildup and the militarization contemplated in the Gang of Eight bill speaks to a different vision of the future of the border and of our country than the vision enunciated in this document. The document also makes the point, as Fernando did, that these provisions don't just affect the border, they affect the rest of the country and will increasingly affect the rest of the country. Third point, faith communities have strongly come together on the need for comprehensive immigration reform. I think this is because our basic values are the same. Um, I might add that faith communities have strongly favored the comprehensive reform framework in the Gang of Eight bill as well. This interfaith border narrative was developed over several calls and meetings with a diverse group of faith leaders. One of them is here with us today, Hector Rodriguez of the Episcopal Church, so we're delighted to have him. Um, there really wasn't much disagreement over the substance of the document. The statement doesn't immerse itself in the details of immigration reform, but it speaks to the human dimensions of reform, which is appropriate for a faith document. It denounces the ongoing obscenity of border crossing deaths, the abuses against low-wage laborers, the criminalization of self-sacrificing people, and the destruction of families that's been seen on the border. And it, it imagines a border that's not characterized by walls or violence, but a place of opportunity, encounter, and pilgrimage. It believes that the U.S.-Mexico border, which after all is a border between two allied nations, could be a symbol of hope for border communities around the world, and it should be that kind of a symbol. It should be a place that crosses, but does not divide families, a gathering place for God's scattered children and all of their diversity, need, and beauty. That's the vision and it's rooted in the day-to-day -day life of the border. 
Let me now turn it over to Bishop Ramirez, who's one of the Catholic Church's great leaders on these issues. In 1982, as Fernando mentioned, Bishop Ramirez was the, appointed the first bishop of the Diocese of Las Cruces. And for many, many years, we knew him as the only bishop of the Diocese of Las Cruces and a great leader on border issues and social justice issues. He's also served on the, uh, on the U.S. Bishops Commission, Committee on uh, Migration for many years and many terms. And he served uh, internationally and nationally on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. So we're delighted to have him with us today. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Don. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here to discuss the U.S.-Mexico border from a faith-based perspective. I'm especially happy to be here with you who are experts and distinguished of, uh, representatives from the border region. We are united in a shared vision of our border which is very much at odds with the prevailing reality. We have a vision. Faith-based people are people of vision. We, we're dreamers, and, and we've been dreamers uh, ever since uh, the origins of our Judeo-Christian traditions. Um, <clears throat> Isaiah was a great visionary. Moses was a great visionary. The Old and the New Testament are full of visionary people. So when we talk to ourselves as having visions, we're with good friends. Congress is just beginning a debate on immigration reform, including border enforcement issues. As a Catholic bishop, I'm here today to speak as a pastor on the human impact of the pre prevailing vision of our border and the effect of border enforcement policies. <clears throat> as I look behind me right now, there is Mount Cristo Rey, who's very dear to my heart. Uh, not only because of the mountain itself, but we go every year together with uh, a little group of about 25,000 people <laughs> to celebrate Cristo Rey. Th that statue is, uh, is, uh, is right where three states come together, uh, Texas, New Mexico, and Chihuahua. And uh, in a way, it's kind of like our Statue of Liberty, even though it, it is turned, you know, south. I tell people, you know, actually it belongs in New Mexico, and it does. It's right inside of New Mexico. It's always part of our diocese. Someday I'm going to turn it around to face New Mexico. But they don't like that. Our faith communities, including the Catholic Church, have a unique perspective on our nation's border policies. We witness each day the human consequences of built-up border enforcement. We lament the separation of families. We lament the detention of persons in substandard conditions. We lament the death of individuals in the desert. We console families who are divided, visit those in detention, we bury those who die in the desert. We are the ones who are there to deal with the human consequences of enforcement. So we have something important to say about U.S. enforcement policies. In the end, we need to be mindful, I'm sorry, <clears throat> second, we attempt to build communities across borders and build uh, and bridge divisions, not to create them. In fact, this is how we see the border, as a place of encounter and solidarity, not one of division. Another thing that happens uh, just behind this mountain, along the, uh, uh, the, the New Mexico, uh, Mexico border, uh, at Anapra, is a, is a border mass that we have every year on the 2nd of November. And the, uh, the Catholic Bishop of uh, El, Paso, or El Paso and Las Cruces and the Catholic Bishop of Juarez come together. Sometimes other bishops join us. And uh, we put two tables together the, 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 there along the fence. And we celebrate one Mass. It is a Eucharist a Mass with our borders. And um, it's too bad we have to do that. Someday we'll have one table uh, that will stretch between the two borders and not with, without a fence to separate us. When we give the sign of peace, for example, we can't even extend our hands and shake hands. Uh, we, can't, you know, we can't give each other an abrazo. We just put our palms together and that's how we give the sign of peace. And it is, uh, it is sad that sometimes there's an over, there's a strong presence of, of, uh, of law enforcement 
border patrol officers that are there, sometimes in great numbers. This last year there were only a few, but other years we've had good numbers of them present. And it is especially um, sad to see uh, helicopters flying over our mass over and over again. If there's something not very good about that. So um, <clears throat> our southern border should be a place of mutual support with an extending hands across boundaries, not a militarized zone. I'm deeply concerned that some of the provisions in a new legislation will permanently militarize our border and that human rights abuses will occur. Many worry, wrongly I believe, about the future cost of legalizing 11 million. Uh, I worry about the, the cost to our families, communities, and ultimately our nation of a more militarized border, of constant surveillance of communities, and of even greater intrusion into our lives. We're, you know, we're keeping out people who uh, uh, want to come and contribute to the welfare of this country. The immigrant, in my perspective, the immigrant is a very brave, courageous person. The immigrant comes here to work. They don't come here to, uh, to be a problem. They want to contribute. Many of them have families that they want to support, and they want to educate. The, the, the people that, that we receive, from, especially from Chihuahua and uh, Zacatecas and some of the other northern states, are, are people who are hardworking. They have a strong work ethic and they, they're proud of their work. And they, not, they don't worry about working in dairies, which is very hard work, in ranches, uh, in, in, in farm work, whatever it is they can find. They will do it if, if it's going to provide a, a decent uh, way of life for their families. In the end, we need to be mindful that there are many ways to reduce irregular migration, not just the imposition of enforcement measures. The legislation before us would create legal avenues for low-skilled workers to enter, which could help. Migrants should be allowed to come legally to work and support their families, but we also need to look at push factors. That is, why do people risk their lives to come and address those issues, global poverty and persecution? The vision of the border from a faith perspective is one of welcoming and solidarity. Welcome is a beautiful biblical theme the whole history of salvation began with an act of welcome on the part of Abraham and Sarah. They uh, fed these strangers who were passing by. They must have been hungry. They must have had a big barbecue because they killed a whole steer. And they had a whole sack of flour to make bread with. And so from that act of welcome, from that act of hospitality, began the whole history of salvation. So wonderful things happen when welcoming takes place. Wonderful things happen when hospitality is offered. Together, let us build a new Ellis Island. We look forward to a day when we can both celebrate our heritage and welcome new arrivals on our border as we did in the 19th and 20th centuries in the, in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty and now in, in the shadow of Cristo Rey. Our legislators have a chance to embrace this vision in the months ahead. I would urge them to read this document, to listen to the experiences, hopes, and aspirations of our border residents, and to adopt the vision that builds on the strengths of the best qualities of our communities. Thank you.